Thank you and good afternoon. I thank Talking TR for inviting me here and I hope you will have some good time together and speak about really what is happening in our region. Uh, I'm sure all of you are following the news lately from Iraq and Syria because as people who are living in Turkey, those news have become a part of our lives. Uh, and as those news show us, there is an ongoing civil war in Iraq and in Syria. And the actors of this war are Muslims uh, of different type, of different sort, and of different ideology or different persuasion. Uh, in both Iraq and Syria, there is an entity that calls itself the Islamic State. Uh, it's a very brutal uh, organization that's defined as a terrorist organization by many countries, including Turkey. Uh, and this so-called Islamic State is also fighting other groups. One of them is Al-Nusra, which actually joined Islamic State, but it's a continuation of an ongoing conflict, which is another Islamic actor. Actually, they both sprang from Al-Qaeda, which is a very uh, extremist organization that arose you know, in the Muslim world. And whom are they fighting against with? Well, there is also the Islamic Front, which is different from these both groups, which are, again, uh, made up of different Islamist groups. And then there's the Assad regime, which comes from an unorthodox sect in Islam. But those who support Assad regime, including Iran and Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon, which are also Islamic actors in this part of the world, uh, and when you look, in the, look at the whole region in the uh, Middle East, you will see Saudi Arabia and Iran pitted against each other. You will see Sunnis and Shiites against each other in Lebanon, in, in, in the Gulf, and in other parts of the world. Uh, you sometimes see Salafi Muslims killing non-Salafi Muslims. And it's just a, an ongoing tension and conflict in the Middle East among peoples who are Muslim. Now, why this is happening is a question I think we Muslims should think about. Uh, and I should also add that although these are violent conflicts and in Turkey we are blessed to be in a peaceful society, uh, relatively speaking, there is an ongoing political tension in Turkey as well among the Muslims of Turkey again. Uh, I mean, in Turkey we had a lot of conflict, ethnic conflict, in the per, uh, past 30 years. In the 70s, the, the, right and f red, uh, the right and left factions in Turkey were uh, hating each other, they were killing each other on the streets. And in the past year, a very bitter political conflict emerged in Turkey between two different camps that again define themselves based on Islamic uh, terms. Uh, that also, I think, forces us uh, to have this question, why Muslims are having all these troubles? Uh, well, are Muslims only the uh, faith group in the world that have so much conflict? Well, not really. Uh, but if we compare the Muslim world today with other parts of the world, other civilizations, if you will, we will see that the dynamics for conflicts are stronger here than in anywhere else. Uh, if we compare the Muslim world to another, actually, part of the world, which is, I think, uh, important in this case, to Europe, actually we will see both a similarity and a big difference. Europeans, too, had very bitter conflicts for decades and actually for, civil, uh, for centuries. Catholics and Protestants in Europe killed each other with bloodlust for centuries throughout uh, throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. In the 19th century, European politics became more secular, but then you had conflicts between uh, different nations of Europe. You had nationalist wars. Then Europeans killed each other in the First World War and then the Second World War again. There was so much killing actually in Europe. Ultimately, some smarter Europeans said, can we find a way which will help us to live together without killing each other? and without oppressing each other? Well, from that question on, they built what, is what we call the European Union today, which, which was a project of peace, tolerance, pluralism, democracy, liberal values. Uh, and I think while we Muslims in the Middle East, uh, I mean, if you put Turkey in the Middle East as well, we are partly at least in, in the Middle East, 
we will probably come to such a conclusion and at some point we will say, let's stop killing each other. Or for Turkey speaking, let's stop insulting each other. Let's stop calling each other traitors and enemies within. Let's just build a system, a, a, an approach in which we can all exist without humiliating each other, demonizing each other, and ultimately using violence against each other. But how will we go there? How can we have an EU-like Middle East in which we can have Copenhagen criteria? Maybe we can recall them Ankara criteria or Baghdad criteria, but they should be something nice as the Copenhagen criteria. How can we go there? How do we uh, move towards that future? I think that's a key question for anybody who thinks about uh, the, the future of this part of the world. I've been thinking about that question and I have a few answers. I might be wrong, but I'll try to share them with you. And if I'm wrong, please, you know, share your thoughts and then we can think together uh, after that. Uh, I think, first of all, we should begin by changing the question about this problem. Because actually this problem of conflict, Muslims fighting each other, Muslims killing each other, is actually a, a question in people's minds. You see a lot of newspaper columns in Turkey who, who is doing this to, to, to this Middle East? Why, why, why is this happening? But generally the question is asked, as I said, who is doing this to us? Muslims are fighting each other. Who is making them fight each other? And the common answer is that outsiders are making us fight each other. Who are the outsiders? Well, probably Zionists, Americans, the British, Western powers and their representatives in the Middle East, Israel being number one. They are making us fight each other. Otherwise, we would not have any problem. Then, and then the second question uh, is, how are they making us fight each other? They have some spies, some agents. So some people work on behalf of Israel. Some people work on behalf of Iran, which is another scapegoat for some people in this country. So because of these conspiracies, we are fighting each other. That's the common, I think, explanation. But I think this explanation is a part of the problem because it blinds us to our own role in this drama. Because if somebody else is making us fight each other, then it means we have no blame. And we can nothing, do nothing to change. We can only hunt those traitors, which will be a part of the drama, right? If we say, let's find the enemies within which are working on behalf of those enemies, we will keep on fighting as is the case. So therefore, instead of asking who is making us fight each other, we should change the question. We should ask, what is making us fight each other? Why are we fighting so much? And I have a few answers to that question. I think one answer is, this culture, this political culture that values conquests at the expense of mutual benefits and living together. What do you mean by this? Well, we have a political culture that really values conquest and domination. We celebrate the conquest of Istanbul every year. The conquest of Istanbul is a heroism story, that's fine. Uh, but if your vision, political vision is built on symbols like this, if you value the conquests, you don't see the fact that every conquest has a loser, the conquered. And if you want to be the conqueror, you're certainly making somebody a little unhappy. And if you value conquest so much, someday somebody else will come and be your conqueror. So can we move towards a political culture which will be defined less by militaristic terms and hegemonic terms like conquest, but to a culture of living together, winning together. Instead of zero-sum game where one loses and one wins, can we have a game in which everybody can win? Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan was actually using this term win-win in the first years of his uh, rule, and I actually like to hear that from a Turkish political leader. He doesn't use that term anymore. Now he's using more of about winning and defeating the enemies. So things, didn't, things went back to normal in Turkey in that sense in the past few years. But we should think about that. Uh, how can we have 
a political system in which nobody will be dominant, but nobody will be also oppressed. That's one thing. The second thing I think which makes us clash each other is co too much communitarianism at the expense of individualism. What do I mean by that? It means that we, the people of this part of the world, tend to think more in terms of a part of a community, a jamaat, as we say in Turkish, not any particular community, just communities, rather than thinking as individuals. Uh, in Turkey, there are a bunch of communities. There are the secular community, there is the nationalist community, there is the Kurdish nationalist community, there is the AKP community, there is the community of Hizmet, uh, the Gulen movement, there are certain communities. Uh, and if you have very strictly defined communities and everybody looks in the world through the lens of that community, what do you have? You have four or five competing views. Another thing, in this part of the world, I think we are a bit too confident about our access to truth. In other words, it is very common to say, there is one truth and I know it and I have it. If truth is on your side so much, you obviously are right in every dispute. You would never think that you're making a mistake. This, therefore, the search for righteousness easily becomes self-righteousness, which means you're always thinking that you yourself are right, or your group is right, or your party is right, or your leader is right. Whereas, and, and what is the opposite to that? Is the opposite to that? Well, one opposite, one uh, alternative to this truth claiming is to say there is no truth. That's uh, like relativism. Everybody has a truth, there is no the truth. That's the relativist answer. Well, do we have to go to relativism? I personally don't go to relativism, I must say, because I believe in a truth as well. But I also think that although there is one truth, I have limited access to that truth. I can only try to catch it a little bit, try to understand, but I cannot say I know it. I can't claim it. Now, if all the different religious groups think through these lines, if they say, for example, if all Muslims say, of course Islam is the truth, but we are trying to understand the right Islam as well, we cannot claim it for everybody, things will be a little less tense. But if you say, this is Islam, this is true Islam, I know what is true Islam, and all those who disagree with me are going wrong, they are apostates, they are uh, actually rebels to the religion, you will start to punish those apostates, as the so-called Islamic State in Syria and Iraq is unfortunately doing. So between relativism and fundamentalism, I think there's a safe middle ground that is modest search for truth, rather than a, like a self-righteous search for truth. And I think that's an important point of view to discover. One more thing. I think Islamic law, Sharia, is a part of the tension in this part of the world. Why? Because when you look at Muslim countries, including Turkey, and of course Egypt, Tunisia, and other Muslim countries, uh, predominantly Muslim countries in the world, you generally have some implementation of Islamic law or no implementation of Islamic law, but you always have political movements that want to have more Islamic law. They say, we will bring Sharia to this land. They are called Islamists, generally speaking. Uh, and when they want Sharia, of course, they generally want justice, they just want dignity, so there are many things that are admirable maybe in that demand. But they don't see another aspect of the issue. Sharia, as it's advised, developed by medieval scholars, based on medieval conditions, has some authoritarian aspects. Uh, it's maybe more uh, accurate to call it jurisprudence, fiqh, rather than sharia. But when we look at basically the fiqh of the four Sunni schools and the main Shia school, you will see some authoritarian aspects. For example, one rule is that somebody who leaves Islam has to be punished by death. Apostasy is given uh, that penalty, which is a problem from a perspective of religious freedom. 
there are also some injunctions about forcing people to their prayers, forcing women to cover their heads. So there's an authoritarian aspect. If you ask me, I will tell you that these authoritarian aspects of Sharia do not come from the core of Islam, but they come from historical interpretations, which we can reinterpret today, which we should reinterpret today. But if you keep Sharia as, as something stagnant that doesn't adopt and that doesn't get reinterpreted over time, you have an authoritarian legal system. And, and, and the Islamists want to bring this to the table, they want to impose this, and then there are secular forces which oppose the Islamists and who go authoritarian sometimes in opposing them. In Turkey, we have seen uh, the best example of secular authoritarianism. You know, headscarf in Turkey, for example, was banned by Turkey's secular authoritarians for decades. That was a violation of individual liberty. But in Iran, uh, well, after the Iranian revolution, it became compulsory to wear the Islamic hijab uh, after the revolution. So that, that's a new authoritarianism as well. So how can we have an understanding of Islam that is not authoritarian, that doesn't impose itself to other individuals? Uh, how can we have different understandings of Islam without making one of them dominant over the other? That's also a key matter. And for that, I think Islamic scholars should rethink what Islamic law means. There are already Islamic scholars bringing these fresh interpretations. I admire the views of Rashid Ganushi in Tunisia, for example. He's the one who emphasized Islam cannot be coerced and never be uh, imposed. And there are other thinkers like that, but that's really a key matter because unless we solve that, this tension between the Islamists and the secularists of this part of the world will continue and it will lead to military coups as it happened in Tunisia, military coups as it happened in Turkey a couple of times, uh, and even in some violent con uh, con uh, conflicts such as the civil war in Algeria in the 90s. Now, as you have might notice, you might, have, you, know, you might have noticed. I have been quite critical about the culture of us, the Muslims of the Middle East. Uh, I should say one thing. Are all the problems in the Middle East created by the cultural attitudes that I'm criticizing? No. A lot of the problems are created by other factors. Well, there is a history of colonialism in the Middle East. The borders of Iraq and Syria were artificially drawn by two gentlemen in 1916, so I can speak of. Everybody knows that, right? So there are problems. And then dictatorships in the Arab world were supported by the West, by the United States, by other Western powers. The United States toppled an elected government in Iran in the 1950s. Uh, so there has been a lot of imperialist or Western intrusion in this part of the world. Israel's ongoing oppression of the Palestinians is a key matter in this part of the world until a fair two-state solution will come. So we Muslims also have the right to criticize the West, get angry with the West, condemn the West for its brutal foreign policy in this part of the world, from the Iraq war to the uh, other dramas in our part of the world. But we will not be able to change the West by merely saying, down with the West. We can burn a couple of Israeli or American flags after Friday mosques. It's something. It's not gonna change anything. We'll just make ourselves maybe a little bit relieved, but we're not gonna change them. There's only th one thing we can change. We can change ourselves. We can change the way we look to the world. We can change the way we look at each other. And in other words, if we want to improve things in the region, we have a lot of things to criticize the outside world, but we should begin with criticism inside. But that is also one part of the problem, because self-criticism is not welcome in our part of the world. If you begin with self-criticism, people will say, who are you serving? Who's paying you? Are you trying to denigrate fellow Muslims? Uh, are you a spy? You know, why are you doing this? Or are you an Orientalist who fell in love with the oppressors and looked down upon your own people? Uh, that that rejection of honest, necessary self-criticism, I think, is also a part of the problem. Because without self-criticism, we cannot move forward. And when we look at the Western story, how, if we try to understand how they moved away from their dark ages and their fascist ages and their world war and second war, ultimately they moved on with self-criticism. One problem we have is that the West did all that self-criticism without the threat of a foreign civilization. We are 
being forced to criticize ourselves with the threat of a foreign civilization, which is the West, that makes things complicated. But we should not put ourselves in that trap. And we should think why really Muslims have so much fight. Only then, as Muslims, we can have less fights, when we can have more democracy, we can have more freedom, more dignity, and we can be people that are really worthy of our great faith tradition, which for centuries actually gave the world an, am an amazing civilization that we should now today look back, take lessons and revitalize. Many thanks for your attention.